Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? All right. Try to get this thing hooked up here right where. You reckon that'd be okay if I just stick it in my pocket, Steve? All right, that's what we're doing. Hopefully I won't go home with it. It's good to see everybody. I tell you what, uh, hey guys up there, if you don't mind, can you like give us a little more light today? There you go. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to tempt you to do anything that might be coming naturally to you early in the morning. Uh, plus, I'd like for you to get your Bibles out, turn to the, the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to be in chapter 12. We're wrapping up this series about real life. And there's no other, I don't know any other book in the Bible that is so relevant to real life than the book of Ecclesiastes. You might remember when we first started this series, we mentioned that this preacher or teacher says that he's gone down all these roads to fight, try to find real life. He went down the road of pleasure. When he got to the end of it, there, there wasn't anything there. Uh, it didn't, really didn't satisfy when he, got, when he went down the road of materialism and he gained all he gained, which, remember, richest man in the world, right? He had it all, but it didn't really provide him real life. He went down all the road of education and got very, very, he was the wisest man in the world and, and, and all those things, and that didn't provide real life. And so all these dead-end roads that the writer says that he went down and they none of them pro, uh, uh, provided what the world under the sun, just in this world, not considering God, they really don't, don't provide you anything. So people out in the world that are chasing those things, you're going to find very quickly when you go down that road. It's kind of like one guy said uh, uh, that the world uh, in his business was a rat race. The problem is that if you win that race, you're still a rat, right? And so is there really real life somewhere else? Is there real meaning somewhere else? And so the writer writes this whole book about this and he says because if you don't look at if you only look at things from a worldly point of view it becomes meaningless meaningless a chasing after the wind that's what life is just un, just in this world just under the sun just we've said there's look there's real meaning only in the sun s-o-n right that's where real meaning is and that it's not about escaping the routines of life. It's about making the routine things you do every day mean something and have purpose because when you're in Christ, everything you do has meaning. You have purpose to your life. Well, what the job you go to all of a sudden takes on a whole new perspective when you become a Christian. Now I'm going to this job to meet people that I might can introduce them to the kingdom of God and change where they spend eternity. That's great purpose for living. Now I'm going with the joy of the Lord to influence people, how they can find uh, fulfillment in life when they, and help heal their marriages, help heal, heal their kids, help uh, bring meaning to the things that are taking place, even in the tragedies of life. That's what this writer tries to do. And he gets to this last chapter in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he's going to kind of uh, conclude reminding them of some things. Uh, and first thing he's going to remind them of is about their Creator. He's going to say, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Verse 1, look what he says. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble, some versions say evil come, and the years approach when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. So look what he says basically is, look, it's a, this thing's going to be a whole lot easier on you if you start when you're young. Young people, I know you probably get tired of older people telling you, look, I've been there, don't go this route. I went down that street, but that's exactly what this writer's doing. He's trying to tell people, he's trying to save us some steps. So he tells the young people, now, who are the young people? How do you define young? Well, let me help you on that. In here, if you know somebody older than you, raise your hand. Okay, you're young. Got it? This verse is for you. But it's really important. He doesn't say remember your God. He says remember your what? Say it with me. Creator. One more time. Creator. Why? Because the doctrine of creation is very vital to you understanding you have purpose in life. God made you. You are created in the image of God. You are valuable. 
You've come into this world with talents and abilities. Now, sin has messed all that up, I understand. And, it, and sin has darkened some of our things. Sin likes to take our talents and turn them into something that's more, much more greedy. But God is a creator, not just of you. He's a creator of the universe. Matter of fact, Romans 1 says, even by the creation, you can look around and tell there's a God. There's no excuse for not acknowledging God as God. We need to be sure as a church that we keep on in our Bible classes and in our little kids' classes and the nursery classes telling the story of the creation. Because when they get up to be teenagers and go off into the college, the worldview out there is going to be, wow, oh, that's silly to believe that God made all this. And we want our young people and old to understand the powerful doctrine of creation. Now, I'm not talking about arguing over how long it took to create. I'm not talking about is the earth young or is the earth old. That really doesn't matter to me. I'm 61. Those are the only years I'm worried about anyway, basically, really, you know, and the ones to come, and that's going to be pretty short. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about how long, what are the days, 24 hours in the creation. It doesn't matter. What matters is that God spoke it into existence. He's the creator of the universe. And that's so important because later on he's going to say uh, uh, the one that brought you into this world can take you out, <laughs> right? And that's God. God made you and he made this whole creation. Remember in Acts 17 when Paul going to, to, uh, on the standing on Mars Hill is going to give his sermon to all these people who had set up all these different gods. He gets up to speak and look, I've stood on Mars Hill. I've been to Athens, and we took out that passage, and we, we read the same words that Paul spoke. It's, it's an amazing thing to think about. This is where it happened. But you know how he started? Let me tell you about the God what? Maybe Paul had read Ecclesiastes. He starts with the creator of the universe. Let me tell you about the God that made this old world. Let me tell you about him. That doctrine is important, that God is the creator of the universe. We didn't just come out of nothing. We came out of God's breath and God's mouth. Well, then he talks about, look, if that doesn't motivate you enough, let me tell you, let me give you a little warning. Let me tell you what's going to happen to you, young people. You're going to grow old. And that's what he does in verse 2 through 5. Let's just do a little bit of reading here. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble. You used to, you know, your dad's hand was firm and strong. And now all of a sudden when he holds his Bible it shakes. This, these are going to be pictures of growing old. And the, clouds, uh, and, and the keepers of the house tremble. And the strong men stoop. That guy used to stand strong and tall and now he's all bent over. When the grinders cease because they are few. What is that? Any of, you, any of you have to take your teeth out and put them back in? You lost them when the grinders are few? You know, when it's a good, when it's a good thing and you walk to the table and it's a good thing because you see something soft is being served? You know what I'm talking about, right? And those looking through windows grow dim. The old eyes just aren't what they used to be. And you go to look, giant print Bibles to preach out of. The doors in the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. When men rise up at the sound of birds, you can't sleep. You can't, all those days sleeping, you can't sleep anymore. You're waking up. And the bird, you're waking up before the birds do, or when the birds do, and look, even when they sing, look what he says, but all their songs grow faint. You can't hear them anymore. You're up with them, but you can't enjoy them. Wise men are afraid of heights. You can't climb that ladder. Matter of fact, you know, I'm a kid, I'm a teenager. Walk up here and jump off this stage, that would be nothing. Now I'm afraid to get too close to the edge, right? I mean, that's what happens to us. Say, Mike, you are full of good news today, aren't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> when the almond tree blossoms, you know what color that is? Just look at older people's hair, and that's the picture he's painting. I like this one. The grasshopper drags himself along. 
You know, he used to hop and go and have it. Now you look at the grasshopper, he just comes dragging in. With full day's work, you come dragging in the door, right? You can't wait to get to your chair or your recliner. Because, I mean, you're just kind of dragging it on in. And desire no longer is stirred. I'm not even going to talk about that one right there. <laughs> Except to say this, if you ever watch golf on TV, you ever notice all the, all the commercials are either about how much money you should have planned on for your retirement that you hadn't done, so go get help, or it's uh, uh, Cialis or Viagra advertisements. I mean, that's what's there, for, you know. All those things that are relevant for people, that's right here in the Bible. It's right here. The man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the street. You know what the end of it is? They'll have a funeral and there'll be a few folks gather around. They'll follow your procession out. And the one time you can, the one time that you're not in a hurry, uh, they let you run red lights all the way to the graveside. <laughs> Think about that. Then he says, after all that, death. Remember him before the silver cord is severed, the golden bowl is broken, before the picture is shattered at the spring, the wheel broken at the well, and dust returns to the ground it came from, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. You know what I like about this? He tells us this, that though at the beginning, remember your Creator, because at the end, this old body's going to go back to dust, the one that made it, it's going to take it back there, and your Spirit is going to go be with God. You live in an altered state, but you're still alive. When people die, they're not dead. I'm not in that ground. I'm not in that casket. I'm alive. I'm with God, you see. Now, if you only look at it from a worldly viewpoint, this sounds pretty bad. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything's meaningless. If you're only looking at life without God in the picture, boy, it sure does look meaningless. But you know, in these next few verses, he says, tells us what to do. Follow the shepherd. That's what he says in the next few verses. Look at verse 9. Not only was the teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out. And set in order many proverbs. Now think about this. This is the kind of teacher you like. He does his research. Pondered meaning he weighs those words. He searches out and he gathers them up. And he, has, he organizes them. And he's going to present them in a way that makes sense to you. The teacher searched to find the right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. Now the words of the wise are like golds. They collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by, look, one shepherd. So here's what he says about that. The teacher gives wisdom and instruction. But he also says that the word gives direction and stability. You know what a goad is? That's a long stick with a sharp uh, metal thing on the end of it, and it's how they move their cattle around. They get there behind them, they poke them in the back hind there, and they... They're doing this right here, and they're moving them all in one direction. And that's what the Word of God does. And sometimes you hear the word preached, and it's an ouch. You know, God got me, right? And he's Because he's moving me in that direction, I was headed in the wrong way. And, and that's, why, that's the picture here. He does this. It's a, it's a stick. It's a prod to keep you in the right direction. Then he also says these words are embedded nails. They are like stable. They're firm. They give you a base. So this is the Word of God. And this Word that does this comes from one shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. That's where these words come from. This is a statement about inspiration. But this teacher did not come up with these words on his own. The preacher in Ecclesiastes, Solomon, did not divide, decide all these himself. God put these words in him to give us direction and to give us stability and to take us in the way that we need to go to honor him. Then he gives a little warning here. The, uh, 
he warned, verse 12, he warned, be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. He says, look, you can find all kinds of information out there, right? I mean, you can listen to podcasts, you can read books, you can listen to books. There's, there's tons out there that talk about spirituality, even tons that talk about religion. But what he says, be warned about that. As a matter of fact, you remember over in Book of Timothy, he warned some, from some folks over there, some specifically some ladies there, who are always into learning but never arriving at truth. There are some people who are always asking the questions. They're always into this, I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn. They're reading a hundred books, whatever popular writers out, they've got the book and they're reading it, but they never change their life. They never really arrive at a place that brings fulfillment. You must pour any outside information. It must be sifted by the Word of God. You see, God's Word is what we trust. Don't you trust a writer just because he's a good spiritual writer. Take advantage of what he has out there to offer, but you trust the Word of God, not man. You don't trust a preacher that gets up here and speaks whether it's me or anyone else, you listen, you weigh it out, and you go to the Bible, and the God's Word is the measure of everything that you believe. We must be a people who instill in our kids once again to believe that the Bible has the answers for their life and for ours. And there must be a commitment to the Word of God. I was talking to a, a minister at a different uh, a, a different. Uh, church uh, down in uh, uh, Orlando recently and I was asking him about some different things he had been to and preachers he had heard and was this good and that good you know those kind of conversations he said Mike he said the one thing that's different he said I'm, a lot of these guys know how to fill a room with people but they don't have much Bible and I thought how sad because it's what gives us nourishment and strength to live out the days between the assembly of being together is God's word. So he warns about that. Watch out about that. Then he comes to this last section about fearing God. Now we've said, remember your creator, follow your shepherd, but fear God. I want to read this two verses. Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. By the way, the word duty is not in there. Some versions, I think even this NIV particular version on this on screen doesn't have it in there. It may say all of mankind. But the idea is this. For this is the whole of man. This is the whole of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing, whether it's good or whether it's evil. Fearing God puts all other fears in their place. And fearing God arises out of grace. See, it's really impossible for a man in the world that does not have a relationship with God to fear God in the right way. Now he may fear God because of punishment. He may fear God because uh, of terror, because he knows his own sinfulness. That's one aspect of fear. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about this awe and this respect and this reverence as well as a trembling because of the greatness of God that I fear God and keep his commandments. This sounds very Old Testament, doesn't it? But it's really New Testament. It's always been true that man should fear God and do what he says. This has always been a part of God's will. And to, to have that lifting up of God, how does that happen? Because when I understand, are you listening? When I understand the intense love and grace God has for me, when I can understand that, then my admiration and respect and reverence of God 
gets even greater. When I can look at my, the terribleness of my own sins, remember he said, he sees it all, the good and the bad, every one of them. And when I know that he sees all that's bad within me, and yet he still loves me intensely enough to send Jesus to die for me, how can I not fall on my knees and honor and fear God with great respect and awe for who he is? You see, a understanding of God's love and grace increases our fear of God and raises him up for us to see even how much greater that he really is. All the, the old songwriter had it right, didn't he, when he wrote Amazing Grace? And look, that was a man that wasn't scared of anything. This is a captain on the ship, slave owner, tough. And he comes to know God, and he writes this beautiful song. And the second verse says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved you get it when we don't sometimes respect and honor and fear God the way we should because we have an immature appreciation of his grace and his love over in the book of Luke Turn your Bibles, if you would, with me over there. Luke chapter 12. There's a whole crowd of, of people here. In Luke 12, matter of fact, the first verse says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another... Jesus began to speak first to his disciples and then on to the rest of the crowd. Think about this crowd of thousands. There's thousands of people gathered up in a crowd. Now, in a crowd of thousands, what kind of folks do you think were there? Oh, there were some teenagers running around with some of their friends. There were, there were uh, parents watching. There were, uh, uh, there were people there that were young. There were people there that were old. Look, in a crowd of thousands, who else is going to show up? People who take advantage of the crowd, right? People selling stuff, the pickpockets, the guys looking for your billfold. When they bump into him and all of a sudden it's gone. All those peak kinds of people, they're all here. They're all gathered up in this, in this crowd. And Jesus speaks to them. And in verse 4, he says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. And after that can do no more harm. But I'll show you whom you should fear. Here's that word. Fear him who after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Look, he captures both the, I thought, you know, Jesus, he's pulling out Ecclesiastes here. Because the Ecclesiastes, the, the writer says, God notices every good and every evil thing you do, right? Every one of them. He's going to remember everyone. But what that message is, is that God notices everything about us. Nothing goes unnoticed. Not from a negative viewpoint when you're in Christ. But nothing goes unnoticed about your life from a positive viewpoint. Jesus says, don't be afraid. He knows those sparrows. And he knows every hair on your head. Guess what? The one who loves you so intense, intensely. That he sent his son to die for you. Notices every little thing about your life. And he's there to take care of you. Don't be afraid. Don't have that kind of fear. But you do fear God. Got it? 
So when I can understand the enormity of God's fear and His grace and His love, to trust Him, to know Him, and to love Him is all to fear Him and lift Him up in great reverence and great respect as the God He is. Matter of fact, turn on over to Luke chapter 23. And verse 39, I often thought about this. I wonder if this guy was in that crowd. You ever wonder about the things like that in the Bible? You know, because, I mean, if, if, this, if these thieves were in the same thousand crowd that Jesus talked to, maybe, because look what happens. Jesus is being crucified. He's dying for the sins of the world. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Look what he says. Don't you fear God? He doesn't say, aren't you afraid of death? They're dying. He doesn't say, aren't you afraid to die? He says, don't you fear God? Don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I'll tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. You see, the end... And the conclusion of fearing God and following Him results in being with Jesus. That's the end result of trusting in our great and mighty God. That we get to hear those same words. Hey, you'll be with me. You'll be with me. Remember David when he lost his son? It was such a tragic thing for his son to die. And David said, I, he can't come back to me. But what? I can go to him. See, people that we've lost and we mourn and we hurt over and they, they're with the Lord, they, they can't come back to us. But you know what? We can go to them. And the ticket for going to them is the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the great love God had for us. And when we understand that love and that good news, it only makes us honor and lift up God more and more as we proclaim, God, we fear you and we will follow you. Whatever your commandments are, that's what we want to do. Oh, we don't do them perfect. But aren't you glad we don't have to? God's grace, as Paul said, is enough. You see, to fear God is to understand the, His greatness in light of His grace. If you want your life to look up, bow down. Fear God and follow Him. The wise man said, I tried all those other roads. I tried them, and none of them produced anything. I went down them, pleasure, greed, money, all. I tried every one of them. At the end, none of them were any good. So this wise man, at the conclusion of all his efforts, says, look, Remember your creator. Follow the words of your shepherd. And fear your God. And do what he says. And he'll notice everything about you. And in spite of seeing my weakness and sinfulness, he saves me anyway as I trust him through Jesus Christ. That's good news. 
Now, you have, now let, me, let me ask you. You think Ecclesiastes doesn't have something to say to our lives today? You bet it does. So she came at, to the well at a time when uh, nobody else was coming during the middle of the day. She brings her jar with her and she, she walks over to, to the well. She's going to fill it up and there's, there's a man there. And he, almost, he has the boldness to talk to her. Talk to me? Yeah, he talks to her. Why, a man's not going to talk to a Samaritan woman. But he talks to her and he tells her, Hey, you're getting water? Why, yeah, that's why I'm here at the well. Well, you know, I can show you where you can get some living water and you'll never thirst again. Really? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, go get your husband. We'll tell him about this too. Well, I don't have a husband. No, matter of fact, you've had several. And matter of fact, the guy that you have now, he's not even your husband. The guy you're living with, shacking up with, he's still, I don't know, is he still home asleep? How do you think that made that woman feel that someone would know these details about her life? And so all of a sudden she acknowledges he's more than just a man. There's something greater about this guy. And Jesus shares with her how she can find living water. And the influence of this woman impacted an entire town that came out to hear the story of the man who could give living water. Don't you dare walk out of here thinking that somehow or another your your relationship to Christ and your life cannot impact the lives of others. I don't care what you've done or what circumstance you're in, God can heal your soul, and He can use you for the sake of the kingdom to teach people to fear God and follow Him. You can be used for God's glory. But first, fear God. Follow His commandments. So the question today is, are you ready to do that? Are you ready to lay out, to see the plain, simple truths of the Bible? You see, we can get wrapped up in a lot of religious thought and arguments and all all that kind of mess, but let me tell you something. Honestly, the plain things, the main things of the Bible are the plain things of the Bible. The main things of the Bible are the plain things of the Bible. You're not going to miss. You can read the English language, just see the story of Jesus, and you're not going to miss out on what God wants you to have. Full life, abundant life, and the one that created life and knows best how you and I ought to live it. If you have a need for that kind of life, I want to encourage you to come. You can come today, and if, you, if you've gotten off track, you can come. We'll pray together. We'll walk life together. We'll do life together around here. That's how we do, right? We're family. None of us are better than anybody else. We just have to walk it together. If you've never named the name of Jesus, you can do that and start life all over brand new. Wouldn't that be a great time? Living water. You'll never thirst again. If you have a need for Jesus, would you come today while we stand and while we sing?